Uh, the last area that we're talking about here is visual computing. And basically we're thinking about where visualization is going, especially given the proliferation of the kind of uh, 3D beginnings that you're seeing on the web right now, and also the sophistication in 3D modeling in physical sciences, um, oil and gas exploration, medical imaging, etc. So we see the emergence of what we call visual computing, uh, where you're trying to make a computer view of the world much more lifelike compared to what you see right now in, in graphics. So most of us think of the traditional graphics that served as well for the last decade or two as um, you know, the, what you see today in a graphics engine, uh, triangle-based, rasterization-based. You're, you're taking known polygons that you compete and rendering those polygons uh, up onto the screen based on a pipeline and based on the constraints of that architecture and a driver that, that gets those bits up on the screen. For visual computing, we see that the graphics has to be based more on physics, physical modeling. Things like if you're trying to, to model um, uh, just all the items here on this table conceptually and then how the light impinges on them and get a realistic looking image, you need to do a lot of computation uh, that you may think of as ray tracing or you may think of as uh, finding the path of a photon going through something that is like a glass or reflecting off a table or getting blurred by the surface that's semi-reflective. A lot of computing going on here in order to get to a lifelike rendering as opposed to a kind of um, what you see now in computer graphics rendering, right? Um, I, I look at the games that you know my kids are playing right now on the computer or on these gaming boxes and you know the characters look are beginning to look like they move more realistically but if you you know they, they don't really look like they're alive. Uh, if, if you look at the work being done for computer-generated imagery for films, it's much more sophisticated and things are looking more and more alive. So that's what we're talking about here. In order to make this real, you need to have an architecture that's more programmable, so you can, you can put together these algorithms and program them. They all require a huge amount of compute. And it's not just this 3D stuff, it's also the high-definition audio and video types, right? Our, our eyes and ears are getting accustomed to high definition content and getting accustomed to better and better 3D stuff. So we're trying to figure out how this, what this trend means for computers going forward. So just kind of defining this, we're looking at acquiring or analyzing or modeling or synthesizing these visual workloads. Um, we talked about um, maybe in medical imaging, how do you get a real time, what they call 4D, means 3D plus time, view of what's going on inside the body. Uh, for computational modeling, if you are simulating weather, or if you're modeling an oil and gas reservoir, or if you're modeling the, the crash of a car, you'd all like to do that on a computer rather than a, a real-time heuristic. Um, but that takes incredible amount of compute, and in the end, you get a visual image of, of what you're looking for. You're simulating the real world, basically. Uh, and then we talk about photorealistic rendering. This is the kind of thing that um, the um, computer-generated films are doing right now, right? And so they have to have a, a world model and, and a photorealistic 3D rendering of that world model, and you want to do it as fast as possible, okay? Uh, if you, you know what's going on right now in Second Life, right? You know what's going on in Google Earth. So imagine how those things are going to progress over the next 10 years. We want to be ready for that. What does it take? Um, from our perspective, it takes a complete platform view. We talked about compute, but you need to feed that compute. You need to feed it with the right memory. You need to feed it with the right I.O. You need to have the right graphics display, et cetera. So we're looking at it as a complete platform from an Intel perspective, which means processor, chipset, graphics, media, et cetera, have to be handled correctly in the platform. And it's all based on the fact that we think we're going to be in a great position for doing that in an energy efficient way with our, with our uh, leadership silicon technology. And last but not least, all this stuff won't come about unless we provide all the software developers in the world, uh, probably a million plus people who know how to program on x86 with the tools they need to go make this next generation stuff happen. So the specific that we're talking about here as a product approach is Larrabee. Um, Larrabee is a, our first array of small cores product offering. So think of 
IA or x86 cores with an instruction set that has been extended to include uh, vector stuff, vector memory, conditionals, integer and FP arithmetic, all the stuff that you need to do this 3D kind of computing and supported by a vector processing unit and a wide SIMD engine uh, that helps you get this computation done. So think of it as a IA with vector hardware and vector instruction set extensions that allow you to do this stuff uh, very effectively. And each of these little cores has some cache on board, but it's all coherent across the whole machine. So you have a cache coherent array of many IA cores. And this is something that we think is much more amenable to the programming model than what you would hear from people who are saying, let me, let me give you a GPU and you can program it. We are uh, still having trouble getting people to effectively up, get the most out of a quad core. Mm -hmm. What do we need that for? Ah, this is not a general purpose computer. This is for visualization. So if in fact you're modeling an oil and gas reservoir, you know exactly the problem you're trying to solve. If you are trying to generate a, an image for a film, uh, you know exactly the problem you're trying to solve. It is inherently um, renderable. It, it can be inherently decomposed into small pieces and vectorized. So this is a different message than send your general purpose compute here. That's not what we're saying. Is there a market to want a whole chip for it? Yeah. Uh, the initial product offering would be, uh, for example, a high-end graphics card. Uh, so think of the kind of things that you plug into your system now uh, that's a graphics card, but think of one that's highly programmable. So it could run the industry standard interfaces, DirectX or OpenGL or whatever, but it also offers programmability if people get creative and want to use it in different ways. And NVIDIA, I know those companies, I mean, they, they have, I don't know, 120 cores already, chips. and so Yeah, and the difference is that they don't have something that's a general purpose programmable computer. They have something that is a programmable graphics pipeline engine. So here we're taking the most successful general purpose programming model in the world and we're extending it to do these uh, visualization or graphics or media processing workloads. With those, uh, so this does not replace the CPU in your system. It matter. is the visualization attached device. Okay. With those mini IA cores, uh, are they different from say, the Atom core? Uh, they're, they're physically a different implementation than an Atom core share some of the same concepts of needs to be energy efficient, needs to be small, but it's not the same. And an and, and Atom core is not, a, would you qualify it also as a mini IA core? Or is it yes, a, yes, an Atom core is a, is a small IA core because it runs IA code. Okay. 